We're back. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Third time is a charm. Um, yeah, it's actually quite funny because we did this last week and it went. It went great. It went great. It went great. But yeah, you just never know. <laughs> I'm not so. quite sure what's going on here. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Hopefully we'll make it work this time. So. Thank you all for joining us for the third time um, on the second event of my mom's virtual book tour for Girl Decoded. When does Girl Decoded come out? Girl Decoded comes out on April 21st. So we're three weeks out. Um, and um, the theme of our conversation today, we thought would be around artificial emotional intelligence and this mission to humanize technology, which is of course super ironic because we're trying to humanize technology and I'm, we're failing, failing and miserably getting the technology right now, to work. Right <laughs> now. Um, um, but but the theme of emotion AI is a big theme in the book. Um, I talk, I bring you, I bring kind of the reader behind the scenes and 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 uh, try to explain how do you build emotion AI and what are the applications and the things we're working on. Yeah. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit about that, and I think that's definitely more important than ever um, in our world today, just because people are all working on being like isolated and social distancing. And that can be really hard when um, there's just not like any human connection. And so I'm excited to hear about the technology and how it relates to the current situation we find ourselves into. So can you first tell us a little bit about what Emotion AI is? Yeah. Um, um, and we're just gonna get the yeah. time live set up. <laughs> um. Perfect. All right, so emotion AI is uh, basically artificial emotional intelligence. And it's this very simple contact, concept that technology has a lot of IQ, but no EQ. Lots of cognitive intelligence, but no emotional intelligence. So my entire career has been about injecting technology on our devices with um, emotional intelligence. Um, this idea of understanding nonverbal communication, people's emotions, cognitive states, activities, behaviors, all in the service to make uh, technology more empathetic and more smart. And how does emotion AI work? Like, how do you build computers that can read our emotions? Um, we draw inspiration from how humans do it. So um, the way we communicate is 90% of how we communicate is nonverbal through facial expressions, gestures, uh, vocal intonations. And so we use uh, computer vision, machine learning, deep learning, and speech analytics to train an algorithm to recognize these different states. So for example, to train a computer, say your phone, to recognize that you're smiling, you have to feed it hundreds of thousands of examples of people of all ethnicities and ages and genders uh, smiling. And then you feed it examples of people frowning and maybe like smirking, and the algorithm learns the difference between each of these expressions. Um, uh, at this point, if I'm on stage doing a live event, I usually would do a live um, mm. live demo. Um, but we thought we would try this um, virtually. Virtually. <laughs> so let's give it a shot. We have a guest who's joining us. This is my little brother, Adam. He's going to help out with the demo. Hi, Adam. Yep, as she said, I'm, an, I'm Adam, and I'm in fifth grade. <laughs> And so just so you know, you won't be able to hear us while we're doing the live demo. Um, you will on Instagram Live, but not everywhere else. So, but you will see Adam's facial expressions moving and the technology, and, yeah, the technology reacting to that. And, and Adam's actually going to do the demo. Face. You're actually going to walk through the demo, oh, right? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Um, so I'm going to share our Should I desktop. In? Yeah, yeah, you can talk I through it. I shouldn't. Should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. There we go. So we can start with um, anger. So, Actually, first like, of all, let's just like explain to people I, that it's triangulating on your face and your facial uh, yeah. kind of landmarks, like your eyebrows, yeah, your eyes, eyebrows, your mouth, etc. Mouth, like nose, forehead. Yep. And these, like, whenever they're like points, and whenever you like make an emotion, they move, right? And so that's how it figures out your emotions. So you can see here all these dots. Right. And then 
Yeah. It actually uses the dots to find the face and then it feeds the entire mm -hmm. face region yeah. because you want to look at not just like the location of the points, but also the just, you know, the textures on the face. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell me what to do. So we can start with like joy because it's like easy. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see. Can you start? We start? <laughs> yeah, this is a second. We start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, can you see our Perfect. lovely screen? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, this is the point so it can locate your face mm -hmm. on, so you can see here. Yep, yep. Um, and then it like tracks your face and sees what emo emotions you're doing. And then it kind of it, it then uses these algorithms or which are deep learning based mm -hmm. to map your most dominant facial expression to a kind of an, an emotion signal, mm -hmm. uh, but also a, an, an emoji. And this is kind of a really simple demo of what the technology can do. It's just showing six states. It can do almost like 25 or so different yeah. expressions and states, but we're just they showing a subset. Still can't do that. They also can't hear you, so I stress for them. Okay, but you could, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're good. Thank Alrighty. You. Okay, so let's go back to this. Hopefully that works. Send live. Okay. Let me it again. <laughs> <That's> sad. <laughs> Okay, I think we're back. Yes. All right, cool. All right, perfect. Um, so we actually have a number of questions coming in. Okay. Reminder that you can ask questions and I'll try to incorporate them into our conversation um, and that we love taking five questions. And so the first one is from uh, Janid. Can you tell us something about World of Coded and whether or not Emotion AI is a large focus point in the book? It definitely is. So uh, the whole kind of idea of the book is that it talks about how do you build it's It really tries to take the reader behind the scenes and really simplify and demystify how do you build artificial intelligence, right? And so a big part of the book um, takes you through my journey, building the very first algorithm and how like it failed a bazillion times uh, before it eventually worked. And then, um, you know, so I did that as a student and then, you know, how I continue to do that work uh, at MIT as a postdoc. And then eventually, of course, we have a whole team that is dedicated to building all of this at Affectiva. And then um, another question we had is from Ahmed al Sayed. Can we use this technology and apps as a feature to deliver emotions instead of usual emojis? Yeah, I think that's question. a great question. Um, in fact, one of the applications that I'm really intrigued about, I mean, imagine if right now while we're doing this live stream i somehow had a real-time readout of what you guys were experiencing because i i have no idea right mm -hmm. i'm just like speaking into the ethos <laughs> um and and I, I yeah so i so i i do think one of the great applications of this technology is in virtual events and virtual conferences and even online learning where you could have real-time feedback as a presenter on on the audience engagement and it could take the form of, uh, you know, a, a visual like a, a series of emojis or a graph or even audio cues. Um, can you also tell us a little bit about some of the early application use cases of this technology, but also how the tech is being used today in the market? Yeah, one of the very first applications that we explored was in autism. And mm -hmm. so we um, Back at MIT in 2006, we developed kind of a Google Glass-like mm -hmm. device that had a camera and it was designed to help individuals on the autism mm -hmm. spectrum read and respond to nonverbal cues. Um, uh, and this is now being deployed through a company called BrainPower. They're really commercializing this for the autism population, so that's great. Um, in terms of other applications, it's kind of, sometimes it surprises people that this technology is in market we work with um, a third of the Fortune 500 companies, the global Fortune 500 companies around the world. We're in, deployed in 90 countries around the world to test people's emotional mm -hmm. engagement to content. 
So how do people respond to online video ads, um, you know, Netflix TV shows, movies, movie trailers, and we're able to really characterize how people are emotionally engaging with the content. So I love the next um, batch of questions. They are from Dina, Farida, and Amani, and they all kind of center around um, a girl's path in emotion AI. And so Dina is specifically, how can I start a career path in artificial intelligence and how is it you, for you and your journey? Someone else asked, um, what is it like to be in coding and what are your recommendations for how to learn coding? So can you kind of talk about your career journey and what that, what advice you'd give to others? Yeah, I think what is like really amazing about technology is that um, there is room for everyone. And in fact, we need diversity in technology. It is really critical in how we design our systems. And if we want our devices and our, you know, AIs to work for everybody in the world, we need diverse minds and diverse thinking around the table. And so I really encourage, um, you know, young women who are considering a career to consider technology, it's really fun. People think of coding as like you're sitting behind a computer and you're just like kind of, you know, like typing away. It's not like that. Actually programming and coding and, and just designing technology is very creative and it's a very collaborative process. So you end up interacting with a lot of people, drawing ideas from a lot of people. Um, so again, I think um, I found that it really helped me to find something I'm really passionate about mm -hmm. um, and focus on that. And that's been the driving kind of force of why I built this technology. Thank you. So the next question is from Lisa Chan. Um, her question is, how do you get AI to experience emotions? Ooh, that's a great yeah. question. <laughs> actually, there's a lot of debate around that. So um, the simple answer is that I personally believe that it's going to always be a simulation for technology. Mm -hmm. and, and the clearest example of that is social robotics. Uh, we used to have a social robot at home called Jibo. It's another MIT spin out. And the robot had, uh, um, it, it could express its emotions, right? So if, if, if it was sad, it would like kind of express sadness or if it's excited, mm -hmm. it would express excitement in its, in its um, you know, in, in, in how it responds to you. Um, but, but I don't think that's the same as experience, actually experiencing emotions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the next question is from Abdullah Nafis. Is there any AI documentary you are feature, you're gonna be featured in again? You were in Can You Trust Your Computer? Um, and he loved that. Are you going to collaborate with Elon Musk anytime soon? Ooh. Um, yeah, so uh, Can We Trust This Computer? Uh, that was a uh, documentary that was actually commissioned by, partially commissioned by Elon Musk. Uh, and it talks about the potential of AI, but mm. also the perils of AI and what we need to be careful about. Um, that came out a couple of years ago. It was really fun to make. Um, and then most recently I was featured in Age of AI, which is a documentary docu-series on YouTube um, produced and again hosted by uh, Robert Downey Jr. Um, Iron Man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's exciting and that's available. I hope you take a look at it. So another audience question we just got was, do you use psychological measures too? Um, or physiological measures like heart or skin conductance? Yeah, that is an excellent question. So in addition to the things that you can observe in people, another way to, tr to truly understand people's emotional experience is through psychological measures like your heart rate. Skin, skin conductance is like your sweat level, essentially, and it's a measure of arousal, like how excited you are or how like kind of calm or um, unaroused you are. And, and they provide really interesting information. They are usually captured through wearable devices, although we have technology that allows us to do that using non-contact sensors, just using a webcam. Um, so it's definitely, a, yeah, there's definitely a lot of potential in inc incorporating these types of signals in, in our work. Um, so Farida Tariki is doing a really great job of asking questions. And one of my questions Farida. is, what's your advice to female leaders and how can one successfully lead a business? And what does that look like uh, with kids, et cetera? Um, I'll start with the uh, kind of my main advice to female leaders. First of all, like recognize that you might have a different leadership style. Mm -hmm. I believe that I bring a different leadership style to Affectiva and um, a lot of people resonate with that. And, and I think that's something you bring up in the book a lot. I remember when reading, 
we talked a lot about your experiences and how you came to shape your own leadership style and like find it. Yeah, exactly. And it's very true to who I am, right? So it's it's very empathy driven, very compassion driven, um, and very, you know, I'm very vulnerable and authentic at work just the way I am at home. And I believe that there's power in that. Um, but the other piece of advice I give to female leaders is don't be your own biggest obstacle. I, t I tell, you know, I tell, I, I I mean, I, I tell this story all the time. When we started the company, we hired a business executive to be the CEO and eventually he left and there was um, an opportunity for me to step into the CEO role. And I did not take it because I was very, I, I just recognized that I had never done this before and I was really scared to take this on. Like a lot of women, unless you check 150% of all the boxes, you typically do not kind of, take the opportunity mm -hmm. or raise your hands. So I didn't. And uh, at the time, our head of sales basically took took the role. So he became CEO, even though he hadn't been CEO either. Um, so it took me a couple of years and a lot of mentoring, a lot of um, support from my mentors to uh, gather the courage and believe in myself. And, uh, you know, I, it was this one day when I went mm -hmm. on Google and I, um, Google, like, what are the roles and responsibilities of a CEO? And I created a bullet list of all the different um, jobs a CEO does. And it hit me that I was already doing them. I was raising money for the company. I was, you know, the gatekeeper of our mission and our vision. I, I knew the technology inside out. And so it, anyways, it just hit me that I was already doing all of that. And I had to muster a lot of courage uh, first to convince myself, but then to convince others around me. So don't be your own biggest obstacle. Um, so this next question is from Amir Lakal. Is Affectiva available in Arab countries and what could be the contributions to support the medical doma domain right now? So there is, uh, that's a great question. There is a lot of applicability of AI and emotion AI in particular to, um, you know, the you know, the state of the world today. Um, in particular, there is a ton of anxiety and stress mm -hmm. and angst um, as we all kind of figure out our lives from home and how to be productive. Um, and so there is an opportunity for this technology to help with uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, we know that there are facial and vocal biomarkers of things like depression and Parkinson's. Um, and so there's an opportunity to just incorporate that into our everyday social platforms and be able to flag things like depression. So that's one use case. Telehealth is another one as, you know, again, as we're all practicing social distancing and staying at home, if you wanted to, unless, unless it's like super urgent, it's really hard to now, you know, see your doctor. Um, and so with telehealth, there's an opportunity to use video conferencing, of course, but also some of the emotion AI um, measures to quantify things like empathy or stress or anxiety and provide that uh, data to the doctor. And of course, that's truly scalable once we are able to figure that out. Um, I will maybe put a shout out if this is something you're interested in exploring with us, um, do, do reach out. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how technology can apply to automotive? Yeah, that's also something I talk about in the book a lot. Um, I, I share an example when I was back in Cairo and um, I was really, really upset that this one particular day I was in tears and clearly distraught, right? Like mm -hmm. clearly, clearly not in a state to, to drive um, safely. Still, I got in the car and I got started, I got driving and I was also distracted because I was on the call trying to order uh, food for dinner. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't see this truck cut me off and I just hit it straight on. The car got totaled. Luckily, um, I only just had my shoulder dislocated. Um, but I think about that and I think about what if emotion AI was integrated into my car back then? What if it could detect that I was distracted? What if it detect could detect that I was really upset or I was tired, drowsy, and it could take measures to ensure that I am safe on the road. Um, and you know, you're you're about to start driving, and that's something that I think about a lot. I, I do hope that by the time you're you're you are kind of you have your license and you're in a car that some of this technology is available and it can help detect if you are 
you know, <laughs> distracted or texting while driving or. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mom. So <laughs> the next question is from Shwetika. Um, she can't wait to read your book. Yeah, and, <laughs> and her question is, how can we leverage Emotion AI in the field of mental health specifically? Yeah, Shwetika, I know that this is something that you are super passionate about. Hi, by the way, <laughs> um, miss you. Um, this is something, again, a lot of applications to mental health. Um, imagine if every time you are on your device, it's an opportunity to take, a ch it's a, it's a check-in point, right? And if this device knows you really well, it knows your baseline. So if you start to deviate from that baseline, it can flag that to a doctor. It can flag that to a family member. It can make, get, give you recommendations on how to, mm -hmm. you know, maybe um, take action. So I think there is huge potential in, um, in using this technology for, uh, for mental health. And then can you tell us a little bit about how diversity and cultural differences uh, factor into the technology you build and what you see, um, how you see diversity playing out in the next couple of years when it comes to technology? Yeah, there's a, that's, that's a great, it's something that we think about a lot because one of my main concerns about this technology is building bias into it so that it doesn't recognize, say, the smiles of an Egyptian or an Asian uh, person. So the way we mitigate this is we make sure that when we train these algorithms, we train it with examples of people from all over the universe, right? Um, that's really key. And we also need to make sure that the team that's designing it is diverse too. So for example, there was one, there was one time when we were training these algorithms. We have a team in Cairo that um, they do a lot of the video annotation. So they provide the examples for the algorithm. And a lot of them are women who wear the hijab. And one time they said, you know, we've been labeling all of these videos, but we haven't seen any examples of women wearing the hijab in this data set. And it was a blind spot, right? We hadn't thought, we hadn't intentionally um, not included people who look like them, but it's because they were represented around the table, they were able to flag that. So I'm a huge advocate for bringing diverse teams around the table. It's the only way where you can solve problems. And I think that is especially true in the world we live in today. We need all the creative mindsets um, to help us get through this. So the next question comes from Brian Rendell. Was moving to Cairo from Boston helpful in unleashing emotion AI potential? Um, that's a great question. I do. Th I, I I would say the answer is yes, but it it has maybe less to do. Yeah, there's a, this is kind of interesting. I, I'd say there's a couple of reasons why I would say yes. First of all, when we um, you know the company spun out of MIT, where there is a lot of innovation and a lot of access to innovation, Boston in particular is an AI hub. Um, so we have access to a lot of AI talent, which is fantabulous. It's wonderful. I feel very lucky that we are based here. Um, but there's also a huge um, automotive, like an auto tech, as well as a, as a health, um, health industry. Um, industry here. So, so it's great to be kind of in the epicenter of all of that. Um, and I just, I, I would say what makes uh, America really um, kind of special is, is how people here embrace innovation um and it, i'm definitely seeing a lot more of that in egypt and there's a huge kind of startup grassroots movement which is exciting to see and be part of um so 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 it's it's great to see that but i do think moving to boston helped kind of propel a lot of the work we're doing um so the next question is from abid il -Tanawani. If you, have to, if you had taken on some of the CEO, CEO responsibilities back then, um, would you have led with the same level of confidence as you do now? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, first of all, like I, I still have a lot, you know, I still, I actually think it's healthy. I still have a lot of um, doubts. I'm always kind of reflecting on how I'm doing things, if I'm doing things the right way. Um, so I like to say I'm a work in progress. I'm, I'm not done. And again, I talk a lot about that in the book. And, but but I think there's something really special about this type of humility mm -hmm. because then you're open, you're always open to growth. I always see challenges as opportunities for growth. Um, I don't know. I I learned a lot from from the our first two CEOs at Affectiva, and um, mm -hmm. I I am definitely very grateful for um, you know everything that they have um, they've taught me. 
So the next question is from Jihad Nagib. Aside from Affectiva, which is a great company, can you share a few words on what you believe has shaped you as a tech leader, as a scientist, as a mother, and even as a person? Um, I go back to my core values. I'm a very core values driven human being. Uh, so, and, and I would, I would kind of attribute these core values to my parents um, because they kind of drilled those into us from a very early age, um, me and my two sisters. Um, so the first is a work ethic. We work really hard um, all the time. Um, <laughs> and I, I expect that, you know, I expect that from people around me. So uh, an amazing work ethic. Um, compassion, just having a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion for everybody I interact with. I think that, that that's really powerful. It brings people together in, 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 in amazing ways. And then the third is lifelong learning. Um, and just always being open to opportunities in the world around us. I mean, we are so privileged in so many ways, all of us, in that we have access to amazing experiences and opportunities, even, even COVID, right? Even with all the challenges it is throwing at us in terms of safety and health and, and kind of economic challenges, it is an opportunity for us to learn and to innovate. And for that, I'm grateful. Um, so the next question is from Farah Abdesalem. How do you see this technology developing in the future, specifically regarding distinguishing between real and fake facial expressions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are differences between kind of authentic facial expressions and fake facial expressions, uh, and it has to do with the timing of these signals, but also what facial muscles are activated. Um, so we could very well be able to distinguish between those, especially if we have the right kind of camera sensors. Um, but for me, it's more of a question of why are we doing that? We mm -hmm. try to stay away from applications such as lie detection or deception, because I, I feel like that's not in line with our core values mm -hmm. at Affectiva. Um, um, but, 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 in, but in general, it is, it, is, it is interesting. And I think humans are good at kind of cluing into whether mm -hmm. an expression is authentic or not, and technology can do the same. So the next question is from Ibrahim. Gekert. How did you pick your mentors and how often do you check in with them? That's also a big theme in the book. Um, I am super grateful to my mentors. Um, they have played a very big role in my life. Uh, the first um, is Professor Rosalind Picard, who I read her book and she inspired my work. She continues to be a role model. Um, I think what is really special about a mentor is um, it has to be somebody who believes in you. Um, somebody who will give you brutally honest feedback, so cheers you on, but still kind of can can call you out on on stuff, right? I think that's really critical, and I really think there's power in mentors that you can resonate with. Mm -hmm. You know, like I find it hard to resonate with Mark Zuckerberg, but I but I but when I looked at Roz, I was like, oh my god, like she's a woman scientist, she's smart, she's a mother, she's three you know three young boys, and I was able to just really resonate with her. And so I would also say pick mentors that you can see yourself um, in. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so our next question comes from Abdullah Nafis. Can you talk a little bit about how you see AI in institutional learning? So what that might look like in education, perhaps especially with online learning? Yes, there is a huge potential for this technology with online learning. Again, if you are in a real classroom, an awesome teacher would look at, you know, his or her students and would be able to right away assess the level of engagement, the level of readiness to learning, if the kids are confused or not, if they're frustrated and be able to adapt in real time. Now take that to an online environment where you're often just kind of speaking over, you know, speak, you know, if it's synchronous, then maybe you see some of your students. If it's asynchronous, you've just pre-recorded some video content. Um, imagine if you are, you know, able to quantify moment by moment how these students feel and you're able to triangulate on, on the student who's kind of disengaging or frustrated or bored and help them, you know, help them with their learning. Um, again, sh you know, I, w I will just put a call out there if this is something that you are focused on, uh, online learning, and you would like to explore bringing um, Emotion AI into your online learning platform, we would love to collaborate. So we're gonna to begin to wrap this up a little bit, but can you tell us a little bit about where you see this technology being in 10 years from now? 
Yeah, I I really believe that this is going to become ubiquitous. So the de facto human machine interface, how we interact with our technology is going to just be the way we interact with one another through conversation, through perception, through empathy. And um, to just kind of drive it home, imagine if you're Amazon Alexa, um, you know, you ask it to, to play a song, it gets it wrong. So you ask again, now you're frustrated. Imagine if it can sense that frustration, which of course it doesn't do today. And it can say, oh, Jenna, I'm sorry. It sounds like I got that wrong. Let mm -hmm. me try this again, or let me try something different. Um, so I believe that this technology is going to become ubiquitous. And on that note, uh, for next week's uh, virtual book tour, hopefully we'll get all the technology squared away. <laughs> um, I'm hosting Adam Chayer. He is uh, the co-founder of Siri and he's worked on conversational interfaces for many, many years. And um, I'm just excited to get his thoughts on how emotion AI factors into um, interfaces like Siri and Amazon Alexa and Google Home and whatnot. So join us next week um, for another fun uh, conversation. And just a reminder that you can now pre-order Girls Decoded on all of your favorite book retailer sites. So please do help with the pre-orders. They make a huge difference. Thanks. Thanks Thank so much you. for joining. Thank Bye. you for being patient. Yes. <laughs>